Namaste. Hello, all. This is Dr. Ian Cyrus. I'm a, uh, an ordained uh, Buddhist monk in the Zen tradition. Um, actually ordained in, <laughs> in all three, three of the major perspectives on this uh, as a, a Korean um, Zen, Japanese Zen, and Vietnamese traditions. The, the whole point of me doing this is to talk a little bit about the first discourse of the Buddha. You know, there's a lot of different secular practices going on out there, but very few people actually um, know that about the first discourse of the Buddha, which he, which marks the 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 beginning of the wheel, the Dharma wheel in motion, so to speak. So I'm going to share a, a, a short PowerPoint and I'll make commentary around it so that you'll come to some understanding about what the Dharma is. Uh, mind you, I didn't say Buddhism. All right, the, the Dharma. All right, so let me see if I can share my screen here. Okay, so now I'm screen sharing and I, I hope this will suffice. Um, the whole uh, thing about this is uh, this presentation, like I said, it's the Buddha's first discourse, all right? So uh, we go down to here and basically we're talking about the Buddha as a healer because that's how he saw himself. He didn't see himself as in most uh, religious traditions, as a prophet, he was a healer. He saw himself as a person who, who, who he was an ordinary man who found a way to put an end to this notion of suffering, okay? So, all right. So uh, that's known as the Dhamma Chakra Ravatana Sutra, in which he, he issued a, lectured, which we know today as the first discourse. And like I said, it's he set in motion the wheel of the Dharma, so to speak. So about two months after he was awakened, he not necessarily um, enlightened, he gave a lecture in the Deer Park uh, to five ascetics, and these are the five ascetics who, who during his seven-year trek in the wilderness and trying to find himself, he gave a lecture to them, which which was very interesting because he converted, he literally converted these five ascetics who kind of looked down on him as he was going through his uh, search. So the Four Noble Truths, as we know, is is is, uh, you know, well, I tend to view it as a medical paradigm. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the, 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 the Buddha viewed it in that way, in which he said, I am the great doctor, the great knower, the great physician for the defilements, the unsurpassed surgeon for beings pierced by defilements. So he saw himself as uh, one who, who reached a point where he can help or bring aid to all sentient beings. So we talk about the Four Noble Truths and, and even some people who are not so-called confirmed Buddhist talk about the Four Noble Truths. Well, I, I kind of find that as a uh, metaphys metaphysical truth claim. It, it, it's, that's how I see it. It's a metaphysical truth claim. The Buddha did not make any metaphysical truth claims, although we call it the Four Noble Truths. But the way this should really be looked at is that truths that are held by those who are noble, that brings a whole different meaning and context to the use of these four items that we know today as the Four Noble Truths. So the first noble truth is dukkha. And most people will frame dukkha 
as suffering. All beings suffer in, in this world. But I think the, the, the term unsatisfactoriness is probably more appropriate. And in saying truth or pain, it, it, it's more like, I would say, a continuum. And so that could be someone who has this feeling in their being that they are, um, how should I put it, that life is not quite right. They may have all the money in the world, all the property, all the status, but there's this annoying feeling in their spirit that life is not quite right. He identified that as dukkha as well, as well as on the other end of the spectrum uh, where you, you find a lot of uh, severe pain and, and physically, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. All right. So he identified that suffering or unsatisfactoriness or pain exists. The, the next so-called truth is tanha, which is craving, desire, attachment, um, also known as samudaya. And what samudaya means, it's like imagine uh, a, a match striking a matchbox, that flare up. Um, and in, we all experience this throughout our daily lives, you know, something happened and it caused this thing in you to kind of like wake up and pay attention more than you would otherwise. That's samudaya. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have niroda, which is the cessation or finding the remedy to end unsatisfactoriness and to cease desire and craving. All right. So, you, so th this medical paradigm again is suffering exists. You identify the cause of suffering. You identify the remedy. And the fourth one is maga, which means path. And here we're talking about the eightfold noble path. Again, this is not a, a metaphysical truth claim. Okay. It's, 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 it's not that. All right. So we have the Eightfold Noble Path. And I made some commentary in parentheses here to clarify that to say right is a truth claim. But what I'm saying is here, the, the first of the Eightfold Noble Path is right view. There's no such thing as right view because that has rooted in perspective and context. So it's basically clear view. And in the Zen tradition I belong to, we have a mechanism to allow you to see things in the way that it's meant. And we have this practice known as Kongan or Koan, which is a paradoxical statement that cuts off discursive thinking. You know, it allows you to be able to see things just as, as they are. So um that's a very important part of uh, training as a as a uh, as a, a buddhist uh, a, adherent the next is so the right view is or oh, clear view as i put it the next is right intention and that is more appropriate focused intention there's no such thing again as right intention uh, in my estimate okay the next is appropriate or uh, right speech. Again, we're looking at context and perspective. So right speech, right? But more appropriate is appropriate speech. Saying something and saying nothing, nothing can have the absolute same effect. Okay. So and next we have right or appropriate livelihood whether you're a banker or Wall Street Mughal or, or a farmer, the livelihood that you've chosen has to be appropriate for your state of mind. The next is right effort. So right effort is linked to all of the other um, eight, seven paths or pathways. So, putting the right effort into 
or concentrated effort into what you're doing is linked to right view, it's linked to right intention, it's linked to right speech, right action, right livelihood, okay? So, and then there is uh, number six, which is right effort, like I said, and then number seven is where you find there's a lot of uh, variations on because it's, it's right or attentive mindfulness. So there's mindfulness this and mindfulness that and in, you know, insight meditation and this meditation and mindfulness meditation, it gets literally out of control, okay? But the Buddha, and let me talk about this for a minute, the, the vehicle that the Buddha used to achieve liberation, not enlightenment, right, was jhana, that's D-H-Y-A-N-A. -A. Jhana means mindful contemplation. That's what it means. Mindful contemplation. So that's different than meditation. Meditation is a very confusing term. It can mean a multitude of things, but mindful contemplation puts it in a different realm, okay? And of course, the number eight is concentration. All right, now getting back to number seven, which is attentive or right mindfulness. This jhana as a commentary, I mean to go off on a tangent here a bit. Jhana, when it made its way into China became Chan. It made its way into say South Korea or Korea, it became Sun. It made its way to Japan, it became Zen. It made its way to Vietnam, it became Tien. Now, if you look at all of those, Jana, Chan, Sun, Zen, Tien, it's all the same vocalization. In other words, all of them are transliterations of Jana. So when you use the Zen is thrown about quite a bit, the Zen of this, the Zen of that, the da, 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 da. all right. But however, it simply means mindful contemplation in any of those languages that I just mentioned, okay? And of course, number eight is focused concentration or right concentration. So that's also linked to right view, right intention. The, the mistake a lot of uh, practitioners make with this maga or the Eightfold Path is that they tend to take things one at a time. Number one, I'll do this, and then number two, I'll do that. What I should actually have here is a, graphics, a graphic indicating how all of these things are interconnected. So in any given moment, any one of them or all of them could be present, okay? So it's important to get that. All right, moving on. The Buddha in his first discourse stated that he could not achieve moksha or liberation until he accomplished four tasks in relation to the four noble truths or truths that are held by those who are noble. Number one, he says, destroyed is rebirth for me. In other words, his intention was to get off the birth and death cycle, indicating that reincarnation is real, okay? Number two, number two, accomplished is the spiritual life. In other words, a single-minded dedication to, to monastic life or the spiritual life. Number three is that done is what ought to be done. In other words, when something needs to be done, you do it. And he saw that in his era as he came just like Yeshua ben Joseph or AKA Jesus came to challenge the current establishment. So that the, the Buddha came and challenged the current establishment. Now, mind you, prior to him, you know, uh, realizing the Dharma, 
there was Jainism, there was Hinduism and other religious traditions. And he came and said, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> here's how this is. And that's what he did. He, he challenged the current establishment. And finally, number four, there is no more of this mundane state. This I know. There's no more of this mundane state. This I know. So most practitioners don't realize that he set four tasks for himself in relationship to the Four Noble Truths and the Eight Four Noble Path. Everybody just focus on those two, on those two items, but that, that's not so. All right. So, so again, within the that. He, he talked about, further expounded on the four tasks, and he said that suffering, suffering or unsatisfying, unsatisfactoriness is to be fully known. In other words, I guess what he was implying here is that, is that as human beings, we have to suffer or deal with the full range of the human experience, and if it includes crying or whatever the case might be. Um, I remember a, an incident that took place with me some time ago with one of my teachers, and and I was pretty upset about something. And and he says to me, uh, "Ian, God created you with tear ducts, right?" And I go, "Yeah." He goes, "Use them." I think that illustrates what that means. In other words, whatever you're experiencing, be one with it embrace it don't try and get around it and to that end the next of the extended four task is that what arises is to be let go of and what that does whenever you're having an experience even in the moment you assume the position of the participant observer in other words you be the observing presence and then when you are able to separate yourself from the phenomenon or, or what it is you're experiencing, you realize that you're not your problems, you're not your body, you're not your possessions, you're not your job, you're not, you know, whatever relationships that you find yourself in, you're not any of that. The part of you that's doing the observing, in essence, is the real you. And then you realize that nothing can really harm you. So you, 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 you learn to let go of. And one of the exercises that I teach my students is this. Imagine that you're sitting in a movie theater and you're there alone. And you're quiet. And your thoughts are moving across the screen in front of you like a movie as you're observing it. While you're observing it, you don't attach anything to it, any meaning to it, any significance to it. You just let the thoughts go. And after a while, you realize that the brain is, in fact, a thinking machine, and there's really nothing you can do about it. Now, you can pick and choose what you pay attention to. If something arises, like samudaya, something arises that gets your attention in uh, monk training or monastic training, we are taught to ask the question, what is this? But this is not just some casual question. This is a question filled with a sense of inquiry. What is this? Who am I in relation to what this is, whatever this is, right? So those are the questions you ask, and that is, what is this? Who am I? And how can I help you? So the next thing is the, the third thing. It's ceasing is to be held. In other words, what goes up must come down. What arises ceases. That's the good news. So whatever you may be experiencing in the moment, it's not going to last. Something will change. And that's part of the affliction of, uh, of, of, of us as human being. We want everything to remain the same and nothing does. Impermanence is a real phenomenon, at least within the context of the Dharma. Nothing is permanent. 
everything is illusory. Everything changes. Change is the only constant we have. So that is to be beheld. And the way is to be cultivated. And we already talked about what the way is, right? Maga, those eight full path is the way. So it's an interaction of all of those eight things again that, that gets you to the point where you have moksha or, or liberation and not enlightenment per se, okay? Now, <laughs> people talk and use the term nirvana. Nirvana, like it's some blissful state. It is not a blissful state. Imagine a lit candle in front of you and you will, and you blow out the candle. That's what nirvana means. It's a blowing out of existence. In other words, you join with the source. You join with sunyata or emptiness or the fabric of space if you want to be technical about it. Okay? Okay. Now, the Buddha saw himself as a healer. So this Avalokitesvara, oh, everybody refers to this entity as Guan Yin, and there's controversy over whether Guan Yin or Kuan Yin or Avalokitesvara is actually a man or female. And by all accounts, Avalokitesvara is an aspect of the Buddha that's very male, but due to Kuan Yin or Avalokitesvara's um, compassion for 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 people and and for sentient beings it, he takes on this feminine persona so I, I hope that adds a little bit of uh perspective for you and we'll get into one of the prayers associated with the avalokitesvara now in in the first discourse the, the buddha talked about the, the three three truths of existence. And one is impermanence, the other is suffering, and the other is no self. So if there's no self, nothing is permanent and suffering doesn't exist. The first truth state that everything changes and transforms itself. That's this nature of impermanence and this dynamic movement from moment to moment. Nothing lasts forever. This truth is called an and that Anitya <laughs> in Sanskrit. <laughs> All right. And for those of us who become more or less confirmed Buddhist, if there's such a thing, and by the way, let me clear something up about, about this whole concept of being a Buddhist, whatever that means. Okay. The term Buddhism was more or less coined by. James Joinville, a publisher who lived in the New England area of the United States, in or around 1850, circa 1850 area. He made a trip to Burma and uh, or to Ceylon. And when he returned from that region of the world, he wrote a book. And I think the title of the book is The Spiritual Practices of the People of Ceylon. And in that book, he referred to this practice as Buddhism. Now, you can't have an ism around this, this method or this, the Dharma. It's not an ism, okay? Not at all. So the term Buddha comes from the Sanskrit term bud, meaning awake or awoken. So you can't have an awokeism. It's sort of like a really misuse of language, okay? So don't get it into your head that, that Buddhism is a real thing. It's really referred to as Dharma Vinaya, meaning the mystic law and the discipline thereof. That's really what it's referred to as. But what has happened over the years because of that is the secularization of Buddhism or the Dharma, so to speak. So you have all of these secular groups like the Soka Gakkai, who that group is the largest secular group in the world based in Japan. They came out of the Nichiren sect and 
they are huge. You know, it's well organized, and 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 a lot of people gain a lot of good, good life from the association with the Soka Gakai. I was once a member of the Soka Gakai, but I I felt that there was more to be learned, and so I moved on to the point where I eventually became an ordained monk. Okay, but um, the term secular is somewhat. You know, I'm one of those individuals who like looking at the, the root meaning of words, the, the, what's the origin of that word? The etymological origin of a word is really what brings accuracy to what it is you're reading, right? So the term uh, secular means, comes from the, the word seculum, meaning of this age. Now, the question is, isn't that what, what Gautama Siddhartha did during his time? Maybe what he came and did, or for that matter, Yeshua, Ben Joseph, or AKA Jesus, for that matter, what both of these, these adepts did, challenging the current establishment, maybe in their own way, they secularized the current practice. So, the same could be applied to me as a martial artist and creating my own system, you know, uh, of this age. So most people can say, well, Ian, you're the founder of a secular form of martial arts, using that as an example, right? But nevertheless, we have this new petal in the lotus flower that's emerging, and we're calling it American Buddhism. Whatever that's going to be like, it'd be interesting to see, okay? So... I just wanted to add some commentary to that. The, so we have the five moral precepts and these five moral precepts um, are um, pretty much like the, command, the 10 commandments. I mean, they're very basic things. So you take these precepts and then you become a confirmed, for what it's worth, Buddhist. And that's usually delivered by an ordained priest or an ordained monk and i guess that kind of gives it this religious overtone which turns people off it doesn't have to be that okay but anyway the five moral precepts are refrain from taking a life or killing any living creature refrain from taking what is not freely given in other words don't steal refrain from misuse of the senses or sexual misconduct in other words overindulgence in sex or committing sexual offenses. And the fifth one is refrain from wrong speech, in other words, lying, gossiping, or berating, or anything like that, all right? So these are just very basic things. So here's a, an image of Avalokitesvara, okay? All right, so more about, you know, the Buddha as a, as a healer. And uh, I'm gonna go past this, okay? All right. By the way, the Buddha never refers to him, himself as the Buddha. Here, the, how he referred to himself is more like Tathagata, meaning one does come. If he made any reference to himself, that this was it, not the Buddha. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff here that, that I don't really need to comment on. So this is going to be posted on YouTube and eventually on Facebook. Okay, as a healer, um, in, a, in a more practical sense, uh, you know, the Buddha or Siddhartha's uh, personal physician, his name was Jivaka. And Jivaka was a physician and he, he there's a whole system of medicine that, that arose from Jivaka practice known as Buddhist medicine. And I met some years ago, um, the Dalai Lama's personal physician, his name is Yeshi Dundun. And, and Yeshi Dundun represented the last bastion of, as it were, of what they call Buddhist medicine or Tibetan medicine. I mean, the stuff that he, did was just nothing short of amazing, okay? But that kind of tradition is, is dying, you know? And, 
and with Western medicine becoming more and more prominent, um, even what I'm doing professionally as a doctor of uh, acupuncture and oriental medicine, it's 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 dying, you know. When you consider the uh, you know the 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 advances that are being made in like quantum physics and quantum mechanics, everything reduces itself down to energy and space, and that's what acupuncture and oriental medicine is really all about: is identifying the energetic signatures in the body, whether it's balanced or imbalanced, and then we use filaments or acupuncture needles to direct the flow of this energy so that the person experiences a balanced health. I mean, you, you can call it um, homeostasis if you like. I mean, that's the modern term for it. But it's very interesting that way. All right. And here's an image of Jivaka. He's not this big fat guy that you, <laughs> that you often see the Buddha looking like. Okay, so the Buddha is a healer. Um, Ma Mahayana, which is the Great Wheel Buddhism, um, relates um, Avalokitesvara to the six-syllable mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum. I'm sure you've heard that. Um, I, I put that here. And what is Om Mani Padme Hum? Om Mani Padme Hum is... is uh, it's supposed to be a healing mantra. Now, what is a mantra? Mantra means mind vehicle. So it, it doesn't matter what Om Mani Padme Hum means. It doesn't matter. Just the uttering of the term, um, the six syllables, Om Mani Padme Hum, raises your frequency. It's sound, it's cymatic frequencies. It, it, yeah, so like I said, just repeating the mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum, is, is very important in that sense. So if you want, if you're feeling tired or your mind is scattered or, or you, you're not able to concentrate or, or, or your thoughts are all over the place, a few minutes of reciting Om Mani Padme Hum will raise your frequency and get rid of that cloud over your head. Okay, so when you're using mantra as a, as a tool, um, it is said that you should say it along the lines of like a galloping horse. So it's not Om Mani Padme Hum. It's not that at all. It's more like Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum. It's that kind of rhythm. It sets up the right frequency. And in a room where there's a people, like 20 people in a room uh, reciting this mantra over and over again, it sets up this, this cymatic frequency in the room that uplifts everyone, all right? So my, although my favorite um, um, mantra is the Prajma Paramitra, Paramita Mantra, that is the Heart Sutra. It's my favorite. So I find myself repeating this a lot often throughout the day, and it goes like this, right? The heart mantra, of course, is very long, but it's condensed into, the heart sutra is long, but the mantra associated with the sutra is very succinct, right? It's just three lines. And it says here, the prajna paramita is the great transcendent mantra is the great bright mantra. It is the utmost mantra. It is the supreme mantra, which is able to relieve all dukkha, meaning all unsatisfactoriness and suffering. So why not recite it, right? And is pure, not false. So proclaim the paramita mantra, proclaim the mantra which says, Gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi swaha. Gate gate paragate para gate gate parasam gate bodhi swaha. Gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi swaha. It is said that if you recite this 108 times, it will have a traumatic effect on your state of mind and spirit. Okay? So, 
I, I included that here for your practice. Okay. So, um, and lastly, the Buddha as a healer uh, and through his persona as the Avalokitesvara Oguanyin, there's a prayer and you can also use this to scatter negative energy. And that is, oh, great compassionate Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva. Please relieve the distress and suffering. Please listen compassionately to your disciple, confess and repent. Since I have come to know human affairs, I will always feel that life is not peaceful. I often feel that circumstances are not agreeable to what's relatives and good friends. I am not considerate or helpful enough towards the society and the masses. I lack skillful means to bring harmony to all people. So basically you are asking the Buddha or Avalokitesvara to intercede on your behalf. Okay. So that's basically it. So like I said, I'm gonna post this, this on, on YouTube. I'm also going to post this on Facebook. Once I get it up on YouTube, I'll put a link on Facebook. But to that end, I'm going to be holding a live uh, lecture on this very same thing on Wednesday, July 12th at 8 p.m. on Facebook. Okay, so look there for it. I, and I want to invite anyone who, who feel moved to do this on every Saturday at noon, the Five Mountain Zen Order to which I belong, we hold an open meeting from noon to one, okay? Also, the first Wednesday of each month, we also hold a meeting um, for anyone who wants to attend. The Five Mountain Zen Order is basically opening its doors to, to lay people so that they can get, for what it's worth, some authentic exposure to the Dharma. All right? So if you want to go to our website, the Five Mountain Zen Order website, it's um, fmzo.org. Okay? Again, fmzo.org. And you can browse around the website and see if there's anything that that can help your spiritual life. So thank you once again for your attention. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, as many of you as possible on Wednesday, July 12th at 8 p.m. on Facebook Live. Namaste. <laughs>